My name is Jean Nagelkirk, and I'm the Vice Provost for Health at Grand Valley State University. On behalf of Grand Valley and the DeVos Medical Ethics Colloquy Organizing Committee, welcome to the first ever virtual colloquy program. The title of the program tonight is Who Gets the Final Say? The Ethics of Feudal Treatment. We are pleased that you have joined us and look forward to an informative evening. Our two national experts will each provide a 40 minute presentation, followed by a 40 minute question and answer period. Please put your questions in the question and answer box as you listen to their presentations. Before we begin our program tonight, I would like to take a moment to honor the founder of the biennial colloquy, Dr. Luis Tomatis. It is with a heavy heart that I share with you that he passed away last week. Dr. Tomatis was always a steadfast supporter of Grand Valley and the broader community. He shared the gift of his time, talents, and treasures over many decades, and we will miss him dearly. His late wife, Gretchen Menahar, was a Grand Valley Foundation director, and the couple were regularly engaged in foundation activities and events. Their giving included gifts of artwork and support for the art galleries, the health campus, and the university's endowment. As an advisor to the DeVos and Van Andel families on medical matters and philanthropy, Dr. Tomatis was instrumental in the establishment of this colloquy. He was the founder and a member of the organizing committee and served as its secretary for many years. He actively participated in the committee's work and the selection of topics for programming until his passing. We will miss Louise as a physician who did groundbreaking work in medicine and as a man of integrity and character who helped raise money for health education, scientific and medical causes throughout our entire community. But most of all, we will miss him as our dear friend. We would not be here tonight if it were not for Dr. Tomatis. Let's take a moment of silence to remember our dear friend and colleague, Dr. Tomatis. Now, I would like to thank the members of the Colloquy Organizing Committee for their commitment and education to the success of this colloquy. The members include Mary Barr from Spectrum Health Medical Group, James Bonner from Spectrum Health, Jeff Byrnes and Doug Kinchy from Grand Valley State University, Matthew Demenberg and Allie McGee from Helen DeVos Children's Hospital, Paul Barr, a retired physician, Anne Kleinbauer from Spectrum Health Hospital Group, Con Ned from the Grand Rapids African American Health Institute, Brian Pilkington from Seton Hall University, and Mary Kay Riffa from Mercy Health St. Mary's. Grand Valley is pleased to host this colloquy as we are the major provider of healthcare professionals in the region. We play a vital role in educating and shaping the future healthcare workforce for our region and state. In fact, over one third of Grand Valley students are enrolled in one of the 65 health related programs we have. For these students, ethics is an important component of their education as they become skilled clinicians. And for community members and healthcare providers, excellent ethics is prevalent in their day-to-day -day work and treatment decisions for patient care. This colloquy series brings national experts to our community to assist with discussing and grappling with thorny ethical issues that healthcare workers face daily, providing care for their patients. I would like to thank the Richard and Helen DeVos Foundation for providing the opportunity for Grand Valley to continue this vital series for the community. We will always remember Rich DeVos as one of Grand Valley's great leaders. Not only was he generous with students on every level, from speaking in classrooms 
to serving on the Board of Trustees to leading the Grand Valley's Foundation for 24 years. He was also instrumental in building the university's downtown campus and helped to create the momentum that launched the university into decades of growth. Today, Grand Valley's over 23,000 students see their dreams fulfilled through an educational environment that owes much to Rich DeVos, his vision and leadership. This colloquy is generously sponsored by the Richard and Helen DeVos Foundation, Spectrum Health and Grand Valley State University as principal sponsors, and Mercy Health, St. Mary's, and Metro Health as major sponsors. We are grateful for the support of all of our sponsors who make tonight's event possible. A special thank you to Diane Dykstra, our Grand Valley's Special Projects Coordinator, for her commitment and hard work to pulling this evening off and making sure everything works fabulously together. If you would like to follow along with our program, it can be found on the welcome page. The link to that page is in your welcome email. For those of you who are signed up for continuing education credits for tonight's program, information will be sent to you after the colloquy with instructions on how to get those. Our next colloquy, which is coordinated with our medical ethics conference, which will also be virtual, will be held on February 22nd, 2021. The title of the program is The Role of Religion in healthcare. Again, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you enjoy and learn from our expert panelists. Now, I have the privilege of introducing and thanking Dr. Paul Farr, who is the secretary of the Colloquy Committee and who works closely with all of our speakers. Please welcome Dr. Farr. Thank you, Jean, and I appreciate your remarks so much. Thank you for your leadership and all the wonderful things that you've done to make this possible. As you know, uh, the colloquy idea came up in 2004 when Rich DeVos asked Dr. Tomatis to start an educational symposium about medical ethics, and it was his leadership that got it started. This is the 31st colloquy. We plan to have the 31st in March of this year, but then this COVID-19 came along and we canceled it. So this is our 31st presentation and it's the first virtual one. Uh, I, I have to say something about Luis passing as well, talking with his family today. Uh, I was reminded, we told a lot of stories about his leadership and what he did for Grand Rapids, what he did for the world, what he did for Michigan. Uh, his reach was very long and he did many things and many things that he never claimed credit for. Uh, so he said it the best. He said, quote, I am an incorrigible optimist. If you live well and do well, you will leave something. Your passage in this world will be marked by what you left behind. And among the things he left behind was this colloquy that we are blessed to have in Grand Rapids, attracting nationally known speakers from all over the United States and Europe uh, to re regarding medical ethics topics. Uh, tonight, our moderator is a wonderful internist, palliative care physician, uh, hospice physician. Uh, she will do an excellent job moderating between our two speakers. I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Simi Begg, the Division Chief of Hospice and Palliative Care at Spectrum Health. Welcome, Simi. Um. Welcome to, uh, to you all tonight. You know, as, as, we, as we think about the topic, um, who gets the final say in the ethics of fetal treatment? You know, how did we come to the point of having a conference to answer that question, who gets the final say? And if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense how we got here. Think about how medicine was practiced 50 years ago. You know, the medical team was a small team that took care of the patient, maybe a doctor, maybe a nurse, but, but not, not, not a lot of people. Uh, patients didn't live a, a long time with chronic illnesses. Uh, the treatment options were somewhat limited. Um, we knew a lot about infectious diseases, but 
didn't have a lot of options to treat many of the illnesses that, that patients passed away from. The physician played a very central role in the decision-making uh, with, with the patients and sometimes even for the patients. And when that end of life uh, came about, patients were supported um, the best that we could. And there wasn't a lot of decisions to make. Now you look at where we are today and boy, that has changed dramatically. Now the teams that take care of patients are they're interdisciplinary teams. They're highly specialized. They consist of a lot of subspecialties that work together. Um, patients live a lot longer with chronic diseases, not just, and, 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 they, and they live with the burdens, not just of the disease, but also the treatments of the diseases. Um, we have a lot more treatment options. You know, you think about the human genome, uh, targeted therapy, chemotherapy, stem cell research, all of these things just did not exist uh, 50 years ago. So the decisions to be made around treatments are much greater. As of right now, there's over 6,000 prescription medications that can be prescribed and over 4,000 interventions that can be offered to patients. Um, and so this leads to an end of life journey that can be a complicated, a lot of decisions to be made and patients are really wanting to take a central role in that decision making. So that's why with this question, and you may look at the question and say, well, the answer is, is, is right there, right in the title of this talk. And any of you who have been practicing medicine, who have cared for patients at the bedside, probably have pondered this question multiple times, have really thought about what the answer to this question might be. Uh, I know I have. I, I have thought a great deal about this. In fact, I think I have an answer for it. But, but we're not going to go there tonight. Tonight um, is we have the privilege to have two wonderful speakers that are experts um, that will be, share their thoughts and their knowledge with us. Um, we will learn from them um, and then afterwards have a discussion to really look at the answer to this question and what it may mean. I'd like to welcome my first speaker, Dr. Stuart Youngner. Uh, Dr. Stuart Youngner received a BA from um, Swarthmore College and an MD from Case Western Reserve University, where he is a professor of bioethics and psychiatry. Uh, he did an internship in pediatrics and residency in psychiatry at the University Hospitals of Cleveland, and since then received a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities to study medical ethics at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics in, at Georgetown University. He serves on the uh, editorial advisory boards of the Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, the Kennedy Institute of Ethics Journal, and the Journal of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. He has been elected as a fellow of the Hastings Center and the American Psychiat Psychiatric Association, as, and he has been certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He has served as a consultant to the United States Congress Office of Technology Assistant, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Institute of Medicine, as well as the Ac Academy of Sciences. Dr. Youngner has testified before the United States Congress. He serves as a president of the Society of Bioethics Consultations from 1994 to 1997, and is the founding member of the board of directors of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities, and was given the, uh, the organization's Distinguished Service Award in 2000. Very, very impressive, Dr. Youngner. Thank you so much. Um, each of our panel, uh, each of our speakers will speak for uh, 40 minutes and then uh, we will uh, rejoin to have a, a discussion. Dr. Younger, thank you. Great pleasure to be here and an honor to be a uh, part of such a, um, a, a very established and respected colloquium. So I hope that uh, my comments uh, this evening I add to that tradition and I hope they provoke some uh, questions. Uh, I'm gonna try to get my slide up, my PowerPoint up here now. 
There it is. Okay, we did it. Wonderful. Uh, so another, another subtitle of this could be, uh, who gets to throw in the towel? Uh, as you know, I mean, it, 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 when boxing used to be a, a big uh, sport that everybody watched. Now it's, it's, a, it's still a sport, but not too many people uh, watch it anymore. But the, the, there's a tradition that when a, a fighter was really doing badly and the, uh, the, the manager uh, thought it was time to end the fight, but the fighter him, himself was not going to say, I give up that the manager would throw in the towel to save the, the fighter from unnecessary suffering. And I think that, uh, just as by way of background, I think that that's kind of how most of us think about how aggressive we want our medical care to be. Namely, uh, we want it to be very aggressive until it doesn't work anymore. And that point is not an easy point. That's the point of medical futility. But as I'm going to show, although it has a kind of categorical ring to it, uh, that term is uh, once you reach out and touch it, it's a bit like a bubble being blown uh, by a, a child. You know, you touch it and it kind of evaporates. And if you start looking at the details, uh, Having said that, nonetheless, it's a very important concept. Uh, I ran an ethics consultation service for a number of years, and that was probably the most common consult that we got um, when uh, doctors wanted to stop treatment and families or patients refused to have that happen. So uh, it's, it's a journey that I've seen throughout my medical career. And uh, I've written a little bit about it, and I'm still, uh, I, I still think that a, a clear definition is, uh, is impossible. Uh, but avoiding the problem is also irresponsible. So, so we have a, a little bit of a dilemma, and hopefully we can try to make sense out of it tonight. I guess what I would, uh, in a way, one of my conclusions, and I think this is what our next speaker is going to talk about, is that the real answer is in a, to find the answer to this is to have a process, uh, a, a good process, a fair process, and uh, then futility, whatever it is, could be determined in the best way possible. Okay, enough of that. Um, my experience with futility uh, came with uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, uh, something that was introduced really only in the early 70s. It's a low-tech uh, intervention, but it requires uh, high-tech secondary interventions most of the time uh, once you've resuscitated somebody, say, in the field uh, or even on a, um, a hospital ward, then they have to be admitted to an intensive care unit and get all sorts of support. And our experience uh, wasn't that good. Everybody was excited at once. And of course it was a, an, actually the only intervention that had to be given unless a nurse, uh, excuse me, unless a doctor wrote an order to the contrary, a DNR order. So at least in the old days when this was discussed, a nurse couldn't give a patient an aspirin without a doctor's order, but had to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation on a patient who arrested uh, unless there was a doctor's order to the contrary. Well, it turned out after initial uh, excitement about this that in the hospital, the success rate as measured uh, in uh, patients living to, lead the, li living to leave the hospital uh, is pretty low, 14%. Uh, th this is sort of an average uh, figure from studies around the world. And in some subpopulations, uh, it approaches zero. So if you have a patient who has uh, multiple uh, system, organ system failure, say, uh, it really starts to get to be zero. Um, it's highly invasive, uh, un undignified, 
I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not a nice way to go. Uh, you get zillions of people running into your room and yelling and calling to each other and thumping on your chest and sticking needles in, in you and attaching you to all kinds of IVs. And it can get even more aggressive than that with, uh, I, I've seen open cardiac massage, sticking needles directly into the heart to, to stimulate it. And uh, it, 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 for health professionals, um, I'm gonna go back one here. For health professionals um, working there, it, it was like, wow, what, what are we doing? And I think for, for many health professionals, it was that way about a lot of things. But I, in terms of our public discussion as a country and our legal discussion, it really wasn't the, the issue of futility, it was actually patients and families who be, be, became concerned about overtreatment at the end of life and started saying, we don't want this. We, don't, we want this to stop. We don't want it to start. Uh, it could be, we don't want to go to the intensive care unit. We want the ventilator turned off. We want dialysis stopped. We want artificial fluids and nutrition stopped uh, and so on. And that's where, and, and hospitals and physicians were quite reluctant to do this. Uh, there, it's complicated why that was true. Uh, part of it is kind of, uh, I think many doctors were wedded to the notion of, uh, of the technological imperative. imperative. If you have it, you have to use it. And many thought giving up was failure. Uh, maybe they were worried about, uh, about lawsuits, but it was really what got our attention is when families started saying no and doctors or hospitals insisted on treating and then these cases went to the courts. And over a period of about 30 years, there were many cases, you know, the famous ones, Nancy Cruzan, Karen Ann Quinlan. Uh, and uh, eventually the Supreme Court ruled that there is a constitutional right for a competent adult to refuse treatment. It's actually a constitutional right. And so we heard a lot about patients and families' rights and about how paternalism was not a very good thing, that doctors shouldn't make these decisions, and that uh, when you came to things like quality of life and how um, you know, when you should throw in the towel, there were so many values involved in those decisions that might be peculiar to a patient and different for a doctor, and that the patient was the one who should make that decision. So th that's, the, that's the background to uh, the futility thing. Um, advanced directives were established so that people could refuse treatments uh, in advance of a time when they would become incompetent. Um, so, the other side of the coin. In the 90s, physicians and nurses uh, began objecting to family and patient demands for resuscitative efforts when chances of success were small. And this is true for other treatments as well. DNR got a lot of attention because it's sort of a dramatic intervention, and uh, it, if everybody either dies or gets resuscitated if their heart stops, and so it was it was commonly used. But th these these debates occurred about many other kinds of treatments, and as I said, usually it started out and got most attention about people wanting to stop, and the doctors and hospitals refusing to do that. But in the '90s. The other side of the coin was, it was often the doctors who wanted to throw in the towel and the nurses. And I bring nurses into it because they were very important. And as you know, uh, less true in an intensive care unit, but even true there, the nurses are the ones who are with the patients all the time. And they're at their bedside, they see what's going on, they see their suffering. And uh, so doctors and nurses start saying, why should we resuscitate this patient? I mean, we break ribs, we cause pneumothorax, we know there's no chance this is gonna work, why should we have to do this? And, um, 
they, they believed that they were violating the Hippocratic Oath that said, do no harm. Uh, I, I think that these sentiments were quite honorable and defensible. Uh, they weren't selfish uh, kinds of reasons that, that, that uh, people wanted to th throw in the towel. And they um, began arguing that doctors shouldn't offer and could unilaterally refuse requests for resuscitation or other life-sustaining measures that the doctors thought were futile. So in other words, if a patient uh, or a family member said, uh, we want to be resuscitated, we want a resuscitation here, and the doctor said, this isn't going to work and it's going to cause a lot of suffering and indignity for the patient, and we're going to have to participate in that, uh, we should be able to not mention it as an option or if it's asked for to say, I'm sorry, we're not gonna do it. Not in those words. Um, so others thought this was bad and that you know we just established the rights of patients and families to make decisions and now the doctors were trying to take it away again. Uh, so I wanna try to, sh to, to shed some light on that uh, uh, debate. Um, First, first, I'm going to list the things I'm going to talk about. The rationale for futility. Why should we consider, you know, a, a, a term like futility to give uh, health professionals the right to stop treatment against uh, family or patient wishes? Uh, then the definition of futility, which, get, which gets very interesting, uh, unless it puts you to sleep, but I'll try not to put you to sleep. Uh, the difference between futility and rationing, and this is something that frequently gets confused and that I think is a very important point. They're very different things. They have some commonalities, but they're very different things from a, an ethical point of view. And, um, and then the difference between positive and negative rights. So the rationale for futility. Physicians are not merely body mechanics or technicians. Futile aggressive care harms patients with no benefit to them. And the duty of physicians is to provide a benefit of patients, not to obey their wishes. But patients' rights give patients rights to control certain things, but they can't just tell doctors to obey their wishes like they were technicians in some way, although a good technician wouldn't obey, you know, uh, futile wishes, but um, this, th I think this is the rationale. Um, now, what is futility exactly? Okay, so this treatment is futile. What does that mean? And the person who wrote about this uh, most uh, comprehensively, and I think helpfully, with a couple notable exceptions, which I'm going to share with you, uh, he and I disagree a lot, disagreed a lot about this, but I, I think that his, his way of framing it was extremely useful. So I'm gonna share that with you now. Um, he said there are two kinds of futility. There's what he called qualitative futility. And, uh, and this is while a given intervention may cause an effect, the effect is no benefit to the patient. And therefore the intervention is futile. And I'm reminded of a kind of a sarcastic, joking uh, thing that was said about uh, internal medicine physicians when I was in training. Uh, I won't tell you all the ones that were said about psychiatrists, I'll just tell you this one. Uh, but it was that an internist is a physician who wants to make sure that uh, his or her patients die with their electrolytes in balance. And I actually saw this kind of thing in the intensive care unit um, because uh, I, I saw people, you know, predictably dying within hours, a, a, a lab result coming back like the potassium is low and an order given to give potassium. And not because it would save the patient's life, but because the doctors just felt badly that they had a patient whose potassium was correctable and they weren't doing it. 
So, so that's, that's an extreme example of that kind of, uh, of futility. Um, quantitative futility is when the chance that an intervention will have a beneficial effect is so small that there is no moral obligation to provide it. Um, an example that I use is, uh, and, and, and another aside is that this issue seems to be much less true for surgeons who decide they don't want to operate. They, they don't seem to have trouble saying, I, I'm not going to, the, the, you know, the operative risk is too high. Uh, it's not going to work. I'm not going to do the surgery. And there's, not, there's usually not a big fight or lawsuits or anything about that. But in the intensive care unit, we really, I, I believe, out of this idea about patients and families have rights to make treatment decisions, that it got, it got a little bit out of hand. And... Um, so here's the case, uh, a, a young man in apparent excellent health, 18 year old, is going off to college and he goes to his uh, family doctor who delivered him and says, I'm, uh, I'm going off to college, could you give me a physical exam? And the doctor says, sure. And the, and the, and the, the kid says, well, you know, I'm, I also, I, I'm, I'm bothered by, uh, by this, so uh, it's right, sort of like a runny nose. This clear fluid keeps coming out of my nose. And the doctor says, well, let me examine you. And he examines him and all his vital signs are fine. The lungs sound fine, the heart sounds fine. And the doctor says, well, John, I, I think you have a cold. And John said, well, I, you know, I was on the internet and I read that there's a condition where um, there can be actually a hole in the brain in the ventricles and in the frontal ventricles, it, it can leak out through the nose, which is true. This, this is, is a condition. And I might have that. Can you tell me? And the doctor says, you don't have it. And, and, and he says, well, can you tell me with a hundred percent certainty that I don't have it? Well, the doctor can't say yes, but the doctor could say, and I'm making this figure up, but the reality is something like this. Well, I can't say with the, the zero percent chance, but I can say that out of you know two hundred million doctor visits for the common cold, three per year turn out to be this condition. And the patient said, "See, you can't say it's zero. You know, and then the patient demands a neurology consult, and then uh, and then he gets scanned, and then, and then he says to the neurologist, "Well, don't scans miss things sometimes?" Well, yes, they do. Well, okay, well, I want a neurosurgeon. And then he goes to the neurosurgeon, I want you to operate and go in there and see if there's a hole. Well, it's, it's absurd, right? We all say, well, that, it, you can't say it, he doesn't have it. He could be one of those three out of, you know, millions who has it. But it, a doctor could just say, I'm sorry, let's see what happens. And, and we can reevaluate. So it, that the idea in itself is appealing. Now, let's look at Schneiderman's, Schneiderman's um, argument here. Schneiderman says that he gives, he says, okay, let's, I wanna give you some examples where you could actually apply this clinically. Uh, and he says, well, when a physician concludes, either through personal experience, experiences shared with colleagues, or consideration of reported empiric data, that the last 100 cases a medical treatment has been useless, they should regard that treatment as futile. And then he does some confidence interval stuff, which means that of the next 100 cases, there's only a 3% chance that something will work. That's what that means statistically. Okay, well, first of all, personal experience? I mean, I don't, I'm sure there are physicians out there, but do you say right away, say, well, yeah, I have a hundred cases exactly like this. And uh, none, none of them uh, were successfully resuscitated. No. Sharing experience with colleagues. I mean, it's a very, that's a very unscientific thing. And I say, well, what about case studies? And that's a better answer. But the problem with case studies is that, again, they don't, if you, if you have a case, all the cases should be the same, and they rarely are. 
So for example, some of the first studies that came out um, didn't have adequate uh, numbers of patients. And they concluded things like, uh, nobody in this study of 560 patients at Mass General Hospital, uh, nobody with a diagnosis of cancer survived. So then it became a kind of uh, common wisdom not to resuscitate people with cancer or try not to resuscitate them. And then, you know, a few years later at Sloan Kettering, where they had lots of cancer patients and they could sort of see how they were the same and different, it turns out that that just wasn't true. And the same was true for age, that people were very old. If you're 80, you can't be successfully resuscitated because in that study, none of them were. That's also not true. So uh, this is, it's, it's nice in a way, but um, I, I think it's, um, it's, if you apply it, I don't think you can apply it honestly. Now, qualitative futility. This is, it, it doesn't provide a benefit. So what counts as a benefit or not a benefit? So Schneiderman and his colleagues uh, said, well, in keeping with the qualitative notion of futility, we propose that any treatment that merely preserves permanent unconsciousness or that fails to end total dependence on intensive medical care should be regarded as non-beneficial and therefore futile. So he would say that uh, people who are in a permanent vegetative state or unconscious state, uh, that if, if, if their families say, we want to keep him going in a nursing home with a feeding tube, uh, that uh, he can say no. We're not going to do that because this is not a benefit to the patient. Now, the problem with this is that it, now I, I have to say that I, in my living will and in my conversations with my wife, I've told her if I'm ever in a persistent vegetative state, I definitely don't want to be kept alive. And if I am, I will be, if, I, if I'm capable of anger, which I'm sure I won't be, I will be very angry at you. But that's me. Studies show that a certain percentage of the population, maybe 10%, does think that life in that state is a benefit. And who is Schneiderman to tell them that they're wrong? And that, and that, of course, he claims this. That's the other thing that I don't like about Schneiderman. He puts this under the aegis of medical science, that I've shown by medical science, and I'm a doctor, I'm a medical scientist, that this is not a benefit. Well, that's just not true. And then the other one is depensive, the, uh, dependence on intensive medical care. So I, I, I know Larry, and I have lunch with him occasionally, or I, I did a long time ago. And I, so I said to him, so uh, what, if, what if you have a patient who's, say, chronic obstructive lung disease and is in the th for the third time with pneumonia and you got them off the ventilator the last two times, but they're not going to get off this time. But they're awake. Their family visits them. They watch television. Um, and you say to them, you know, your life isn't a benefit to you, so we're going to turn off your ventilator. And the patient says, well, actually, I I'm not ready to die. I, I enjoy, I want my family to visit. I, I want, you know, the Browns are pretty good this year. I want to watch them. What are you going to say to him, Larry? And he says, well, in that case, you can make a, a physician exception. Well, there we are back to paternalism. I don't want somebody telling me whether or not my idea of a life worthwhile living is right or wrong. And, and so I, I, I really think this is my opinion that this is not acceptable. Now, uh, I could see when we talk about rationing that a society could say it's not, you know, it's, it's a waste of our resources. We have limited resources and keeping people alive in persistent vegetative state is not a good use of our resources. But you realize if anybody tried to say that politically, they would be killed. I mean, it, it's not something that, that is feasible political to say politically that 10% of the population's views on something, especially because they'd probably be religious views, and even people who didn't share them 
who believe deeply in religious freedom would be very upset by it. So I, I, I don't, I think it was a nice try and he helps us, gives us a way to talk and think about it, about what chance is a chance worth taking, how bad does quality of life have to be before it's not a benefit. But I think there's a problem with saying that doctors have special expertise to decide that. That's my view. Okay, let's go on. Futility and rationing. I'm gonna just look at my watch here so I don't commit some terrible faux pas. Okay, I, I see 14 minutes left. Um, futility is an, uh, an intervention, so what's the difference? Futility is an intervention that actually will not achieve a beneficial goal. Okay, so it will not achieve the goal. Rationing, an intervention will achieve a beneficial goal, but must be denied to some people because there isn't enough of it. That's what rationing is. So if you ration, rationing futile care doesn't make sense. It's not rationing. You shouldn't give futile care. You could save a hell of a lot of money by not giving futile care. And of course, we know that outside of the intensive care unit, we give all kinds of futile care to patients, write prescriptions for them for antibiotics, with viral infections, and so on and so forth. You can look at medicine and see where a lot of futile care is given. But in this particular one, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's a different story. We, we, just, we just can't, as a society right now, we are incapable of making rationing decisions as a policy. Now we were with the COVID epidemic where there literally weren't enough ventilators for a period of time in some places and policies were made to say who gets it and who doesn't. And there, there were some tricky uh, ethical issues in that and disagreements about it, but it was done because it had to be done. That the decisions had to be made so they had to figure out a way to do it. Um, okay, similarities. Both result in, if you ration and you, re, uh, and you withhold futile care, they result in saving resources. But the differences are that futility affects individuals and rationing affects populations of individuals. Uh, if you're gonna say PBS is not uh, something that is worth our spending our money on as an insurance company or a society or a hospital system, uh, then say it. Then say it and see what happens or have a vote about it uh, or advertise it. But Schneid Schneiderman's idea that I mean, it would be wrong for a doctor in an individual case where the hospital doesn't have a policy to decide, well, you're in a PVS, so we're gonna stop care because I'm the doctor and I know this isn't a benefit to you. Or I'm gonna, you know, I like, you like watching television, but this isn't a benefit to you. You have to have, in other words, futility is kind of a private thing. This stuff isn't gonna work. Whereas rationing is, it is gonna work, but, we think it has lower priority. And that's, then it becomes very, very political. Very, very political. It's about allocation of resources. Who should get it? The youngest people, the oldest people, the first in line, uh, the richest people. And, and, and th these are debates which we really can't have in this country at this point publicly in our, in our uh, Congress. Well, they can't do much, they, there are a lot of easier things they can't do either, so anyway. Uh, now, positive and negative rights. The part of the problem uh, with, um, with the futility debate and people who said that doctors really don't have a right to deny futile treatment is the difference. Negative rights are the right to be left alone. And uh, they're very strong in libertarian oriented countries like the United States. So most of our uh, constitutional rulings are about, about negative rights. You can't do this to me. Uh, and certainly the refusal of treatment is one of them. You can't touch my body without my permission. So it's a right to be left alone and it's a negative right. 
A pos and they're stronger than positive rights. A positive right is a right to have something done to or for you by someone else. I have a right to this. Um, and in our country right now, um, we're kind of ambivalent about whether healthcare is a right that people have a positive right to. Is there's certainly not wide agreement about that. Now, more and more, there are categories of patients who in fact do have a right to healthcare. If you're over 65, you have a right to Medicare, and there are certain categories of children or families with children who can get Medicaid, but it's not everybody. And let me, let me give you an example of how I think this is, is a, a, a absolutely uh, crazy in this country, but I, I don't know how it's gonna change. So let's say that there's a, oh, by the way, if you show up in an emergency room and you're, and you're very sick, they have to treat you. I can't remember if that's Mtala or what, what that law is, but th that's a, you know, in the last 20 years or so, because people used to just put them in cabs and say, go someplace else. Uh, but yeah, so, so that's a positive right. If you show up in an emergency room and you're, uh, you're dying of heart failure and you're not breathing well, they have to admit you and put you in an intensive care unit. Okay, but let's say that you're, uh, let's say you're a 50 year old woman, uh, you have two jobs, uh, none of which has insurance. You're, um, you have uh, adult or teenage children that you're trying to help. And on a day off, you're at the mall and lo and behold, uh, there's a, a table there uh, with people from the local hospital saying free blood pressure examination. So uh, the woman says, yeah, what the heck? You know, I feel okay, but you know, it's free, I'll, I'll do it. And she gets her blood pressure taken and it's the, the person taken says, oh my God, your blood pressure is really high, it's sky high. And the patient says, well, I feel fine. And the person says, yeah, but that's the problem with blood pressure, it's a silent killer. What, what do you mean killer? Well, it can wreck your kidneys, your heart, your brain. Well, is there anything I can do for it? Sure, they're medicines. Do I have a right to those medicines? No. Can I say, well, I, you know, give me those medicines because I have a right to be treated for high blood pressure? No. But if I stroke out and end up in the emergency room, I have a right to go to the emergency room, go to the intensive care unit. And if I complain, uh, it, I can ask for futile resuscitation or my family can't. So it's, it, it, it is a little strange, uh, strange in context. Um, so um, I'm gonna, I'm actually I'm ahead of time and uh, rather than fill my extra time with, uh, with futile uh, words, I'm gonna just uh, maybe as an entry into the next talk say, why patients and fam, why do they do it? Why would somebody ask for futile treatment? Well, first is often a failure of health professionals to set, set goals early. And the worst, the question that doctors should be fined for asking uh, is, uh, patients very sick, they're in the, in the intensive care unit, uh, it, it looks like they're gonna you know, fall apart and die soon. And the doctor goes, says, do you want us to do everything? Bad question should be banned. Um, those kinds of questions lead to patients uh, and, and uh, family, families rather, uh, who, who, who have to make these decisions have, a, have a, a, an extremely high rate of PTSD. Multiple studies have shown this. So ignorance, why would you demand this? Well, you think it's gonna work, but it's not gonna work. So that's communication, isn't it? And, some people just don't trust the medical system. And that might be because they're paranoid. It might be because they had a really bad experience the last time, or it might be because they belong to, a, a, to an ethnic group that uh, where their grandmother's telling them stories about what, how she was treated when she went into the hospital 40, 50 years ago. And I was there and I saw it, and it, those are stories that, uh, wouldn't make me, if it was my grandmother, would make me a little leery about going into a hospital. So establishing trust is so 
important. So anyway, I'm going to end just saying that this idea of throwing in the towel, um, the, the intensive care unit with all these interventions gives everybody the illusion that they can control death. Now, it is true that they can almost always control the timing of death. They can ring out a few more minutes or hours or days or weeks, but they're not going to defeat death. But there's this idea that they might defeat death. And that's the illusion of control. The burden of responsibility is at some point, somebody has to say, you know, death might be not a bad alternative here, considering what the other alternative is, which the other alternative is getting broken into pieces during a resuscitative effort. So um, I, I hope I've stimulated some questions. I look forward to uh, um, what people have to say about this. And uh, thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Youngner. What a stimulating talk. I, I have so many con you know, ideas and questions in my head already, and I know our audience is going to be eager to ask many more. I will say I should have come prepared with psychiatric uh, psychiatry jokes, though. I was not ready for that internal medicine one, but maybe, maybe after our next speaker. Um, now on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Gabrielle Boslett is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Department of uh, Pulmonary and Critical Care Sleep and Occupational Medicine. He is the Assistant Dean for Faculty Affairs and Professional Development at Indiana um, University School of Medicine. He's also the Fellowship Director for the Pulmonary and Critical Care F Fellowship and a faculty member at the Charles Warren Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics. Uh, he received his bachelor's degree from University of, of Notre Dame and his uh, medical degree from Ohio State University. He completed his uh, uh, residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at uh, Ohio State University Columbus Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, Dr. Boslett completed his fellowship then in pulmonary and critical care at Indiana University, where he was a chief fellow in his final year of training. Uh, during, during this time, he also completed a clinical ethics fellowship at the Charles Warren Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics and a Master of Arts in Philosophy and Bioethics. Thank you, uh, Dr. Boslett. Um, and again, we'll have 40 minutes here, and then we will begin our question and answer session. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you great. And I'm going to share my screen and I just want somebody to say that you're seeing the correct screen. Or am I good? Yes, you're good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for having me. Um, when I was invited uh, to, to give this talk at this uh, at the DeVos colloquy, I looked back over the years at who had spoken before and boy, um, it's, it's humbling um, the people who have spoken at this. So, and also humbling to share the stage with Dr. Youngner, who I've read his stuff for a long time and, and hearing his introduction, I, I, I sort of wanted to just slink out, out of the room and go get a beer somewhere uh, rather than give this talk, but, but I'll do my best. Um, I have no conflicts of interest um, with this talk. And I'll start with a story, if that's okay. The story will be um, how I came to be the first name um, in this long line of very distinguished people um, on this document published in 2015. And the way that came about was I was a fellow. Um, it was 2009 uh, at Indiana University. I was getting my master's in philosophy and I was an ethics fellow here. Um, and we had a patient who was intubated with the same endotracheal tube for 194 days. Um, the family would not um, consent to tracheostomy and the family would also not consent to uh, liberation from the ventilator and this sort of tore our ICU apart for a very, very long time. Um, and I sat down to um, give a talk on this topic, on the topic of um, disputed uh, treatment requests. And um, I realized, um, I, I, I went to literature, the primary literature, which is what I do, and I found this paper from 1991, written by a, a group from the American Thoracic Society, which is my one of the home societies that I belong to as an intensivist. 
And um, this paper was the last one published really by the ATS on withholding and withdrawing life-sustaining therapy. And I, I was drawn to section three, a life-sustaining medical inventor intervention can be limited without the consent of patient or surrogate when the intervention is judged to be futile. And you can read down here what they meant by that. Um, Dr. Younger went through some of this before and, and I, I read this and I was like, wow, this, you know, I've been a physician for seven years and this doesn't read anything like what we do. And so I had a, a cup of uh, Starbucks coffee and I was feeling good and I uh, typed up an email. Uh, I took a while to type, type up a well-worded email to a guy named David O, who's at the University of Seattle, who was the chair of the behavioral sciences or the behavioral uh, uh, science assembly at the American Thoracic Society. And um, I sent it off to him and I basically said, hey, you know, we should look at this again because this is almost 20 years old. This was 2010 at this time. Um, this is almost 20 years old, and why don't we do it on uh, update two decades on and, and, and kind of take a look at to get some smart people together and take a look at this again, and, and I sent it off, and um, I, nothing happened. Uh, I didn't think about it again, and weeks went by, literally weeks went by, and I, I had forgotten that I would written the email. Well, about three weeks later, David O emailed me back and said, Gabe, you know, I, I, I'm sorry for my silence. I, I've been looking into this, and you're right. This is ripe for uh, discussion. He said, is it okay if I send your email to some people? And I said, sure. And he proceeded to forward my email to pretty much every important person in, the wor in this world uh, in regards to this topic in intensive care medicine. And um, my inbox was lit up with people who were like, yes, let's do this. So I wrote a project proposal as a fellow um, to the American Thoracic Society and they funded it and we were funded ultimately for five years. We continued this project until it was published in 2015. And, um, and um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, really the substance of this paper. And I'll have a little um, detour in the middle re in regards to uh, communication. Um, and when you talk about disputed treatment requests, there's really a differential diagnosis here, right? So if someone asks you for something that the physicians don't think that they should provide, that, you know, in medicine, there's such a thing as a differential diagnosis, which is when you have a set of things that are presented to you, what are the, what are all the things that could, that could uh, be causing that? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the differential diagnosis conflict just very briefly on the next page. And then I'm going to talk really about communication as the cornerstone of avoiding and solving these issues. And I was, I was pleased to see Dr. Younger's last slide there where he talked about the call, why families request um, futile therapies. And I, I, was, I noted that four of the five, failure to set goals, ignorance, mistrust, and confusion, all are solved with good communication. The only one that maybe isn't was the illusion of control and the burden of responsibility. So we'll talk a lot about communication as a cornerstone, and then I'll really delve into sort of the nuts and bolts of the, the pragmatic document that we try to put together and compare futility versus what I call potentially inappropriate, or I don't call, we call potentially inappropriate treatments, and then legally prescribed or legally, legally pres discretionary treatments. So what is the differential diagnosis of treatment conflicts? Well, really, there are really four potential. We, what we set out to say in this document was, if, we, if, you are, if a family requests a treatment that you as a physician don't agree with providing, that, is the, that is, represents one of four different things. Either you're, you haven't communicated well, or you're not connecting well with that family, or they're requesting a potentially inappropriate treatment a futile intervention or a treatment that we deemed legally proscribed or legally discretionary, and I'll talk about what this is. And really, these four things should encompass pretty much all disputed requests for treatments in the intensive care unit. And if you look, most of these are communication issues. So this was a paper in 2003 of a pediatric intensive care unit. And they said, look, if this gray bar represents all of the times that physicians sit down with families and say, hey, we should probably limit what we're doing here because it's unlikely to be of benefit. What happens in all of those? Well, after the first meeting, over half are resolved. The family agrees with the clinicians over half the time. Of the 40, of the 48.6% that are left that we call that we would call conflict, after a second meeting, almost 80% are resolved. And after a third or more meetings, 97% of disputes are resolved. So I, I show this to demonstrate that, that truly intractable conflicts are quite rare, probably not even 3% of um, cases in which uh, physicians recommend treatment limitations. 
Um, but they are, boy, they, they loom large for those of us who are involved with them. So we came up with four recommendations um, in this paper. I'm gonna start with recommendation one. And recommendation one is simply about communication. Institutions should implement strategies to improve, prevent intractable treatment con conflicts, including proactive communication and early involvement of expert consultation. We talked about systems level interventions and then clinician level skills that, uh, that institutions should uh, foster both within their institution, but also within the, the, the clinicians that are at the bedside. Um, and we sort of lay this out. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take a little side detour in just a second and talk a little bit more about clinician level skills. But the other thing that we talked about was the fact that you should be okay with a pinch hitter. This is Willie McCovey, uh, who many think was probably the best pinch hitter of all time in the major leagues. And physicians should be okay with bringing in someone else. If they're just not connecting with the family, it's maybe not that you didn't do a good job, it's just that you're not gonna connect every time. So, be, so the idea behind this is to be willing to put your ego aside and bring in a pinch hitter if needed. I'm gonna detour here just a second to sort of deconstruct a little bit more what I mean by quality bedside communication. Um, and so when you ask patients, as a, as a general rule, we know this empirically, when you ask patients what they want from their physicians, they say two things. And you know this because you've got, you guys all have aunts and grandmothers and, and uncles who say, oh my gosh, I love my gastroenterologist, he's the best. And they never say he's the best because he drives a great colonoscope, right? They say he's the best because he listens or because he or she cares. That's it. F patients want from their physicians, people who listen and people who they know care about them. So how do we do this? How does a clinician at the bedside demonstrate to a person that they are listening and that they know that are, or, or that they care about the person. I'm gonna give you four ways. These are simple. The first is the most simple, and that is to sit down. You would be absolutely flabbergasted at the number of times a clinician walks into a patient's room in the intensive care unit, doesn't really know the patient or family, and just starts going into a conversation about whether or not they want chest compressions. You should sit down every single time. Your eyes should be at or below the level of the person to which you are talking. Why? Because we know that, that we, this, is a bad, this is a surrogate, but patients think that you're in the room five times longer than you are if you sit down. It's simple. If there's not a chair, I make an act out of finding a chair. Get a chair and sit down. The second is to avoid using cognitive language. Any difficult conversation has three channels, a cognitive channel, an emotive channel, and a meaning channel, and physicians love the cognitive channel because we were boiled in it for at least four years. And it sort of becomes the only channel many of us are able to talk about, talk on. But the emotive and meaning channels are much more important in these conversations most of the time. So, so how do I know that using cognitive language doesn't work? Well, as Ellie Azalea, uh, did a great study in Europe um, several years ago where he literally took the, intense, the ICU physicians in his ICU and said, look, I'm going to do a very simple study. When you go into a family meeting with the family, I'm going to have my research assistant grab that family immediately after and ask the family three things. What's the diagnosis? What's the prognosis? And what's the treatment of their family member? More than half the time, family members were unable to relay all three of these things. Families, when things are difficult and when conversations are hard, just aren't in their cortex. They're in their amygdala. And learning to speak to an amygdala is super important. The next two tactics get at speaking to the amygdala. One is just to talk less and listen more. We know this to be true. We know the patient satisfaction scores goes up the less we speak as clinicians. This has been proven in intensive care unit settings and in primary care settings both. And so what do we do? We speak 71% of the time when it's measured. Especially in difficult family meetings in the intensive care unit, we should be doing everything we can to flip this around. This is extremely hard for physicians who like to be on a soapbox for the most part. And the last tactic, the fourth tactic I'm gonna give you is to use unburied empathic statements. Um, anyone who's gone through communication skills training as a physician, has often heard of nurse statements. These are just um, ways to sort of use empathic statements, 
But using unburied empathic statements is important. Saying things like this, I can see how scary this is. Without following it up with a, but we have to make a decision, just throwing that out there is what, I, what we term an unburied empathic statement. We are very bad at this as physicians because we like to fix things. And any, any conversational tactics that aren't moving toward fixing things, we don't think have much utility. But when conversations are hard, these statements have more utility than almost any other. These are four tactics. You can't learn these tactics by sitting here and listening to me blabber into a, into a, a webcam or watching it on a screen or even hearing me blabber it in person. It wouldn't, still wouldn't work. The only way you can do this is by practice. So I have this, I have no conflicts here. I don't work for Vital Talk, but if you're interested and you're a physician, Vital Talk, I think, is the gold standard for learning communication skills, bedside communication skills. Um, I, it, is, uh, um, it is wonderful. So I'll give a pitch. So that's just a little taste about bedside communication and, and how, and some very simple tactics to do it well. Um, and if, you're, if, you're, if this interests you at all, you should look into trying to get a Vital Talk course or a lot of places are doing their own stuff that is really good. So I'm gonna dip back into um, the document that I wrote. Um, I, I'm happy to take any questions at the end about communication skills, but I think, I'll be honest with you, I could give a talk for an hour just on communication skills. Um, and I think it's far more, this is far more important than the stuff I'm gonna talk about here in a second. So Dr. Younger did a terrific job of um, really contextualizing everything that the group that wrote this document um, was immersed in when we sat down to write this document. And so if you've done a good job of communicating, then you're left with these three things. Um, there's actually four here, but I'm gonna talk about three. These three things on your differential diagnosis, futile interventions, legally proscribed or dis legally discretionary treatments or potentially inappropriate treatments, which is what we call the vast majority of these. And we had drop dead, drop, drop dead arguments amongst the committee about what we, should what we should do with the F word, futility. Because the fact of the matter is, and Dr. Younger did a terrific job, so I eliminated a bunch of slides actually as he was going through his stuff, um, of, because the problem was in the 1980s and 90s, we tried to define it about a hundred million ways. And um, Paul Helft and Mark Siegler and John Lantos did a great job of summarizing that in this paper from July 27th of 2000, where they talked about the rise and fall of the futility movement. And the fact that, the, that because we couldn't agree on a definition meant that futility did none of the heavy lifting that we wanted. And most of the committee that I worked with on this document agreed with this. And so there were those on one side that wanted to not even use the word fuel in this document. And those were some on the, there were some on the other side of this committee that wanted to really make futility as the cornerstone of this um, um, project. We decided to make communication as the cornerstone of the project, I think much to its benefit, but we also minimized futility of a very good bit. We used the term potentially inappropriate to describe those treatments that have at least some chance of accomplishing the effect sought by the patient, but that clinicians believe that competing ethical considerations justified not providing them. Now, if you paid close attention to Dr. Youngner's uh, talk from before, this, uh, this is pretty commensurate with one of Schneiderman's uh, definition, his, his uh, uh, I believe, quantitative definition of futility. Um, and we decided to get rid of the word futile because we just didn't think it did the heavy lifting that we, that we wanted, that we wanted it to do. And we called futile, futile treatments those which could not achieve its physiologic goal. Now, what does that do? That means that futility turns almost essentially only on medical facts and judgments, which are, only, which are clearly within the purview of clinicians. And treatments that are potentially inappropriate, which are those that clinicians feel should not pr be provided, turn both on medical facts and judgments, but also, also on values and notions of the good, which brings about an ethical complexity that makes it a lot different than treatments that we call, that, that, with, that fit within our definition of futile. So then if we're calling potentially inappropriate a treatment which has a chance at achieving the goal, but which clinicians feel should not be provided, how, who should decide? Well, if you're a physician, you agree probably that surrogates should not have unilateral or decisional capacity. Um, and Dr. Younger touched on this before, so I'm not gonna go into this a ton, but there are really strong emotional challenges to foregoing life-prolonging treatments for a loved one. We just don't wanna lose those that we love. 
And there's no positive right to interventions that are, out, that are considered outside the boundaries of medical, accepted medical practice. If there were, then it relegates me, an ICU physician, as simply a technician. I'm just the endotracheal tube putter inner and the ventilator taker outer. And that's not how any of us see ourselves. So most physicians agree that surrogates should not have unilateral decisional capacity. I'm also gonna make the argument that it can be very problematic to make a single bedside clinician a unilateral decision maker as well for the three reasons listed here. I'm gonna talk about these three reasons in a little bit more detail. The first is undue variation. On a macro level, this is data from the Dartmouth Institute that shows that on a macro level, there's wide variation in the use of intensive care unit services in the last six months of life. Most would argue that this geographic um, variation is probably reasonable based upon medical norms, right? Maybe in Chicago, they believe much more strongly in the intensive care unit, whereas seemingly in, the, in, in, in more rural places, um, they believe in, a, in sort of avoiding the ICU a bit more. And that seems okay, but acknowledging at least the fact, and, and the Dartmouth Institute has done a good job of uh, showing us that there is a lot of variation in how we do this. It is, not, there, it is not monolithic at all how we approach end of life decisions. And even on a much more micro level, these are data from a single intensive care unit, nine physicians who all round in a single intensive care unit, and they were studied for a certain period of time. I think it was well over a year. And you can see each of these lines represents an, an intensive care unit physician. And the number of times that, the percentage of time that decisions to limit life support within the intensive care unit are, is, is decided upon varies from 5% to almost 50%, simply depending on the attending physician who happens to be on service when you are admitted to the intensive care unit. This is massive micro variation within an intensive care unit. That's undue variation. The second reason why physicians should not have unilateral decision-making capacity at the bedside is, is based on a paper that Bob Veach wrote in uh, the early 1970s, published in the Hastings Center Report, which I think is one of the, in my opinion, still one of the best applied ethics papers I've ever read, called The Generalization of Expertise. And the generalization, generalization of Expertise says this, and I'm going to illustrate it with, a, with an example, so don't freak out if these, there's a, these bunch of big words uh, fly by you. The Generalization of Expertise says the following. Uh, technical expertise in an area does not entail the normative knowledge of how to deploy that expertise. Here's your example. Because Einstein was able to come up with a theory of relativity, which led directly to the atomic bomb, nobody necessarily thought that Einstein should be the one that we go to to ask how we should deploy it. Although he was involved a little bit, interestingly enough. But... Um, you know, the fact that he had the technical expertise to come up with the science that led to the atomic bomb did not entail the fact that he knew how it should be deployed on the earth. The um, analog to that is because I am very good at interpreting uh, uh, flow volume loops on a, on a ventilator and running a ventilator. I like to think I'm very good at it. This knowledge does not entail the normative knowledge of how the ventilator should be deployed for an individual patient. So I've given you two reasons why uh, giving physicians unilateral uh, decisional capacity or unilateral decision-making um, uh, in the intensive care unit is problematic. The first is undue variation. The second is generalization of, of expertise. And the third is a lack of access to the medical marketplace. If you go to the physician for, for uh, uh, an upper respiratory infection and the, your physician says, gosh, yeah, you have a viral illness. There's no antibiotics for this, but you're convinced you need an antibiotic. You can march yourself out of that office and go down to the minute clinic down the road and give them the same uh, uh, dog and pony show that you did uh, to your physician and maybe they'll give you your antibiotic. There's an access to the medical marketplace there. And there are a ton of different reasons why physicians in uh, outside the ICU uh, refuse therapies. We do this all the time. You can see a few of them here. The problem is in the intensive care unit, that medical marketplace doesn't exist. As a general rule, Patients aren't able to pick themselves up and walk down the street to the next, visit, next hospital because of their critical illness and get access to the medical marketplace. So these are the three reasons why requests for therapies in the intensive care unit are problematic from the standpoint of giving a single bedside clinician unilateral, unilateral decisional capacity. 
Now, some people have criticized this paper uh, and criticized this um, uh, uh, position uh, statement and said, gosh, G you know, Gabe, this is, uh, so what are you saying here? Like, we should just, uh, we just have to wrestle it out with, with families and we can't advocate for what we think is right. No, that's not actually what, what we say at all. Clinicians should absolutely communicate well and advocate for the treatment plan and make recommendations that they think are appropriate. But if this is the case, then how do we solve this? And we are not the first group to bring up process-based dispute resolutions. This was first suggested in, in the late 1990s by the, by the uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine, which is again, one of my, proceed, one of my uh, uh, academic societies and is our professional societies and is one of the societies that signed on to this paper. The AMA uh, uh, recommended it uh, by a, from a report from the Council of Eth on Ethical and Judicial Affairs in 1999. And then Texas actually enacted it in the legislation um, in 1999, signed into law by George uh, W. Bush. Uh, the Texas Advanced Directives Act. And so what did we say are reasonable procedural steps in order to resolve disputes about, uh, about therapies? They are these. These are the seven steps that we lay out in detail. And I'm not going to go over these a ton, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point out a few of these. The ones in red are the ones that are somewhat unique to our document. The first is to bring in an expert consultation to achieve a negotiated agreement, not an ethics committee, but just a communicator. Someone to come in and communicate with the family. In case, this is the pinch hitter that I told, this is the Willie McCovey. The pinch hitter to come in and just sit and use great communication skills and do their best. Step number two is notification in writing to the family that we're, we're in initiating a formal process. And the third step is another one that we thought was unique, and that is a second medical opinion. Get another group of doctors to come and at least confirm that the medicine is sound, that the simple medical decisions being made are sound. Yes, this is metastatic cancer, and uh, yes, this is very bad. The fourth uh, step is a case review by an interdisciplinary committee, usually an ethics committee, but it doesn't have to be. Um, if they decide that uh, the treatment should not be provided, then the family should be given an option for transfer. This is not unique. This was written in previous procedural disputes. But the sixth is extremely uh, unique to our document and controversial, and that is that surrogates should be informed of their right to seek extra, extramural case review. They should be told that they can go to court if they like. To, be compel, to, to ask someone else to compel the hospital to provide this therapy. This is controversial. And the last is uh, that the, if once these are all done, then the, then the committee can carry out its decision. The um, underpinning um, ethical, or, or the underpinning framework of this whole thing is that it encourages continued engagement. Participating in this process, starting this process, giving them that written uh, that written document saying we are undergoing a formal review of this should not be reviewed as a trump card to be able to turn your back and cross your arms. It should be seen as the beginning of a difficult and lengthy process of communication. And step six here, their right to seek external case review is at least an internal uh, motivator for clinicians to uh, continue with good communication. Why should we allow judicial intervention? So Doug White and Thad Pope, um, who were co-authors of mine on this document during the writing of this document, published this in JAMA and said that there are really three reasons to, to have judicial intervention on the table. The first is that it encourages continued communication between families and, and, and uh, treating clinicians. The second is that um, judicial rulings often cast large shadows over uh, medical care. Um, Cruzan and Quinlan were, ha have cast huge shadows. I no longer have to go to court to stop a ventilator or to stop a feeding tube, um, even though those uh, court cases did not, did not specifically say that everyone could do this all the time. They just cast a very large judicial shadow. And the third is that it casts a spotlight. It casts a social spotlight onto these issues because we tend to not talk about them that much in the United States. Judicial intervention, in my opinion, has the added benefit of reason giving. I have the, I'm of the opinion, and I wrote this with Thad Pope as well, um, 
that, that reason, written reasons are super important in guiding societies as to how they handle these issues. Um, and if you look, other countries, these are all of the written decisions from the um, uh, Consent and Capacity, not the Consent and Capacity Board, the uh, Court of um, Protection in the UK, which is the court that determines these types of disputes. And they have a ton of written reasons. We have very few since 2004, and none of them are precedential. Only two actually gave published and written reasons and, almost, and none set precedent. We just don't do this well in the United States. So this is why we thought that it was time to both allow these things to cast a shadow and also a spotlight so that we could get more clarity as to what is okay and what is not. Recommendation three is where we finally touch on futility. And we agree, physicians should not um, provide futile uh, treatments and need not go through any process resolution at all in order to say no um, to futile treatments. We define futile treatments as an intervention that simply cannot accomplish the intended physiologic goal. The problem with this is that when you take this definition and you try to find actual scenarios that fit it, it's really, really difficult. If anyone out there has them, I would love to hear them. But the two that we published in the paper were these. A clinician refuses to perform CPR on a patient with signs of irreversible death, such as rigor mortis. Or a clinician refuses to administer antifungals as a treatment for an acute myocardial infarction. If you're a clinician, these two things are kind of absurd. And so using this definition of, of utility really makes it, gives it no operational uh, uh, space at all. If someone asked us to do one of these, we would kind of just say, oh gosh, yeah, that's not something we do. Thanks. Thanks. There are, however, um, times when clinicians are actually authorized to act unilaterally against a family's wishes, and they don't really need to get anyone's permission to do so, or they've been given permission, I should say. Brain death, the, Univer the uh, Uniform Declaration of Death Act uh, from 1981 um, gives clinicians uh, uh, or at least gives model um, legislation for that almost all states have, have adopted at this point, and in, in, at least through the courts, all, all states have at this point. Um, request for inappropriate or expedited transplant. If you come to me and say, I want a liver transplant, um, I'm in a liver ICU over here, I can generally just say no, uh, because that's, that is mandated by uh, the... Uh, UNOS, not, not, by, uh, not by me at the bedside. And the last is request for CPR in states, which actually have legislation that says physicians need not give CPR when they think it's not going to be a benefit. So how do we do these? If these, if these three scenarios don't really fit into either potentially inappropriate or futile, and so we created a third category called legally prescribed or discretionary. These are those that are prohibited by applicable laws, judicial precedent, or widely accepted public policies. This is a very small category, right? So, so if we look at the three categories in our, in our uh, societal document, we have futile treatments that clinicians are justified in unilaterally refusing, potentially inappropriate treatments, which are treatments requested by families, but which clinicians feel for whatever reason should not be provided. And those need to be resolved by a procedural resolution process. We created a third bucket called legally proscribed and discretionary where clinicians need but act in their role according to the statute or the uh, applicable judicial precedent or whatever in order to um, resolve the dispute. In the United States, this is a very small bucket. We created this bucket thinking that maybe it would over time be filled. And we created recommendation four to hopefully fill it. Recommendation four is that the medical profession should engage in efforts to influence opinion and develop prospective policies and legislation about when life prolonging technology should not be used. We should gather stakeholders and ask difficult questions of those stakeholders to try to outside of specific scenarios in which there are um, invested actors and emotional family members, 
say what seems reasonable. Should we provide CPR for a patient with advanced metastatic cancer? Most clinicians generally say no, but at this point in time, if the family says yes, we're sort of stuck. So recommendation four is really, we created the legally discretionary and legally prescribed um, um, bucket, and, and then we, we tagged on recommendation four, which um, provides at least some sort of deliberative democratic way for that uh, bucket to be filled. So this statement, um, I'm just gonna wrap up by saying, um, really puts a preeminence on bedside communication. And I will just go on record as saying, I don't think that medical schools and residencies do nearly enough to teach training physicians how to communicate with others. Uh, we were doing better job, a better job than we did now here at IU. We have, uh, we've, we have our kind of our own local version of, of vital talk, um, that we have rolled out, um, to places that want it and need it. It's just expensive and hard to get funded. Um, but we need to do more of this. Um, this statement brought together the five largest critical care societies in the world, um, to kind of harm try to harmonize definitions and, uh, a resolution process. We created the third category that I talked about, although it still remains five years on, essentially unchanged from when we published this um, paper. And um, this statement acknowledges um, that it may be helpful to have extramural interventions in order to move this issue forward in the United States. I will end there and thank uh, the ATS for supporting that work, Doug White specifically for mentoring me through this project. If you remember, I was a fellow when this all started and um, that's all that I have. Dr. Basla, thank you so much uh, for that talk as well. But like I said, uh, after Dr. Youngner's talk, this just stimulates so many thoughts and, uh, as a physician, as a palliative care physician. And I'm eager to hear um, what our audience um, has to say, the questions they have to, they, that they would like to ask. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start with the question and answer session. I'll um, uh, ask you, uh, both of you, is Dr. Youngner on? Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to start um, and, um, hope, you know, just take, oh, there he is. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, and, you know, just take a minute or so to um, answer the questions. If I ask one of you specifically and the other has a comment, uh, please don't hesitate to give in your input. Um, I'm going to start off by a little bit of a question, uh, a, a legal question. Um, we have an attorney in the audience who, um, what he says or she says, is that um, I have um, overseen a number of cases across the countries where families of brain injured patients have requested futile care for their loved one. In a surprising number of cases, the doctor insisted that the individual had sustained irreversible brain damage, but the patient made um, at least a partial recovery. Where can I find data on the percentage of patients who survive after receiving this futile care? Or is it considered futile only after the patient dies? Dr. Boslett, do you want to take a, a stab at that question? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, that, so yeah, this is really difficult. So we, we've we sort of shot ourselves in the foot, in my, in my opinion, and Dr. Younger may disagree, but you know, there was a point, there was a period in time where we try to put a hard, um, I'll talk about brain death for one second, but we try to put a hard line in the sand and say, look, brain death patients cannot survive. They, they their, their, their entire brain is dead and their body will break down and it is only a matter of time um, before they will die. I, I think that we, we have ha enough cases now to know that that just isn't true. Um, if you even look at the Jahai McMath case from California, she lived for, I don't know, three or four years after she was declared dead. Um, she wasn't, she was, didn't interact with her environment. She was completely dependent upon, uh, technology for that, that, you know, life. I, I use the word, I, she lived for four years and that's controversial, but her body was there for four years. So this notion that even brain death is 
provide some sort of hard line in the sand is difficult. If you look at the data of patients who have a medical, who suffer a medical anoxic injury, not a traumatic injury, those are different, but a medical anoxic injury, about over months and months and years, about 5% of those patients will have some sort of neurologic recovery. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going back to work as, an, as an, an accountant or that they're even able to care for themselves at all, but that their neurologic status two years on is different than it was when they were prognosticated upon two years before, 5%. Um, and so giving these sort of um, absolutist answers to what's going to happen to my loved one who suffered this terrible anoxic injury is problematic just because we're really bad at predicting. And we get ourselves into the predicaments that the question asked her, asked her brought up, right? I've had multiple, you know, now we have these stories now, right? That we just, we just heard about. I have multiple patients who've been told they have irreversible brain injury that showed some sort of recovery. Yeah, it, that, it, it does happen. Often what we do, we do a poor job of communicating the fact that the most likely scenario is abysmal and the best case scenario is still often abysmal. But, but we use this absolutist language to say they will never recover. And then when they do, even to a tiny extent, mm -hmm. that is grabbed onto as the fact that the clinicians were wrong and they were destined to be wrong in that position. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a problem. And there are no real data. There are no real great data to say the patient in front of you is going to be one of those 5% who show some recovery. There are no prognostic signs that we can do that. So you can, I can show you data that 5% may recover over something over two years. But I, what I can't tell you is that if it's that, if it's person X laying there, whether they're going to be in this camp or this camp, it's just really fraught. Yeah. Dr. Younger, any comments you want to add? Oh, Dr. Younger, you're on mute. There we go. <laughs> um, I think that brain death is a, a special example. Uh, and brain death is, is filled with lots of other kinds of problems. But somebody who has been accurately diagnosed as brain dead is never going to wake up again. That, that I, I don't think there's ever been a case where they woke up. Now, it, it was interesting uh, when uh, that Dr. Boslett referred to the patient as being brain dead and they died later, which as a psychiatrist tells me that he doesn't really think they're dead. And most people don't actually, because that's a common mistake that's made. But with brain death, there are patients who have been, the, the common wisdom was that they would uh, suffer cardiovascular collapse within days of the diagnosis, but it turns out that that's just not true and that they stabilize with good uh, uh, intensive care so that they really don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. And there, there are, there's a case of, of a kid who became brain dead when he was four who lived for 20 years after that, uh, or caught lived, I don't know, whatever this means, at home. Now, he, he, he was on a ventilator. He didn't recover his ability to breathe for himself, but he didn't need anything else except feeding tube. Uh, he didn't need an intensive care unit. He never woke up. And, and actually, when he, an autopsy was done, and he had a brain that was completely calcified. Uh, it was as big as a fist, and there was no living tissue in it. And so was that care futile? I, I mean, it, the, the mother didn't think it was futile. She had him at home. Right. But, I guess, I guess a, but, the, but, but the point is, are we going to, I mean, at some point we have to take seriously um, things that are so poor quality of life that it's not a benefit. I mean, it's hard for me, I mean, PVS, I'm willing to give the 10% or 15% and think that's worth going, sure. But should we keep people going because somebody thinks that somebody without a brain at home is worth it? I, I, you know, it's, it's a, those are very difficult questions. It turns out that we, if parents fight hard enough, they're often hospitals giving because they're worried about bad publicity. And uh, I, I hope that my hospital won't do that. You know, okay, go ahead, sue me. 
for, for stopping uh, a respirator on somebody who's legally dead. I mean, sue me. But hospitals don't think that way. <laughs> Let's avoid the whole thing. Right. It does get very tricky. And this kind of leads to my next question. Um, again, Dr. Youngner, I'm going to direct this to you. You know, is there a risk of systemic oppression when employing this kind of rationing of futility of treatment? How well, can okay. rationing of futility of treatment? I, I don't, those are two different terms that mean two different things. So what, what's, what's the, so what, what the, what, uh, what uh, the, the question is, is that when physicians are participating in what is futile, is there a chance of providing inequitable care that uh, perhaps there will be some implicit bias that um, enters on the physician's standpoint? They, they, perhaps, they might provide futile care to this kind of patient, but not that kind of patient? Correct. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, maybe I, I'm not no, I'm not aware of any studies, and maybe maybe Dr. Boslett is, but I I'm sure it's true because we're we're all biased in in ways that we do or don't aren't even aware of. But I don't think that comes into it. I I think it's just the doctor's view of things. Right. That that that's that's a very tricky question because you're right. We're humans are biased, Dr. Boslett. Any. Any so, light you can shed on that, your experience? So, or Yeah, the, the, um, the first thing I ever published um, was in 2009, and it was a, a letter to the editor to the Journal of Perinatology. And it was um, a, a, in regards to a paper looking at the use of the Texas Advanced Directives Act on... Um, uh, on, in children um, in their first year of life. Um, so it was basically looking at it from a neonatology lens. And the authors, the, 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 the paper that I, the response that I wrote said, um, the authors said in their paper that, um, what did they say? They said that um, the, uh, there was no bias involved in the care of these patients. However, all six cases they reviewed were minorities. Mm. there was not a white kid in the bunch. Mm. So, um, you know, we like to think of ourselves as sort of above um, that sort of decision making. I'm not implying, I didn't, I'm not implying at all that people sure. were malicious or had any conscious intent, but I think implicit bias is everywhere. And mm -hmm. I think we have to be super careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, Challenging. I mean, I know that in medical schools now and in residencies, there is more training around that issue, but certainly that is something that we really have to be cautious of. Um, Dr. Bosla, what is your opinion on partial codes? Do you consider them futile? Um, so, for example, chest compression. <laughs> you don't like that question. We get this all the time, I know. Um, but so, if, if patients want chest compressions, but no ventilation, but they want ventilation, and are these partial situations, what is your opinion about that? That's a, com that's a failure of communication. Yeah. So I call that a la carte codes, and a la carte codes are not, are just, don't, they, they don't, when I'm on service, that's not an option. Um, mm -hmm. That just demonstrates um, a lack of, a lack of closing the communication loop with the family to understand what the goals of therapy are. You tell me what your values and goals are, and I will tell you what treatments we're going to use to get there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do compressions without putting you on a ventilator because those, that just doesn't work. So that's just not, it's something that I try to teach our house staff that just, if, if, if we have a family request and like that, then, then the procedure to be done mm -hmm. requires only a chair and two ears. Right. Right. So I, I want to say a word about that in, in the old days. Um, I mean, way before 2009, but back in the 70s, uh, DNR orders, people were afraid to write them because they thought they were illegal and they'd get in trouble writing them. And there, were the, the there was a hospital system in New York that had some lawyer uh, that told them that what they should do is keep it secret. And uh, so they, they, they never wrote the, an order, a DNR order. They wrote it on little cards that were destroyed afterwards. And this got in the newspapers. 
And mm -hmm. was, I think one of the things that stimulated people really try, saying we have to have policies about this. We have mm -hmm. to, we have to, people make decisions, they have to write them down. But the partial codes in those days, it was the doctors who wanted, didn't want to resuscitate. Mm -hmm. but they were afraid to write the order because they thought it was like killing the patient and they'd get in trouble. And so there were the various names for them. One of my f favorite was uh, Hollywood Code, which was where the doctor just makes an appearance. Um, but, but I saw them, you know, uh, stand around, you know, just stand around the bedside, don't do anything. But, you know, say we're doing it, but don't do anything. And, those of, you know, one of the things you learn, it's, it's pretty, seems pretty elemental if you go to court, is uh, you better write down what you're doing and, and say what you're doing instead of hiding it, because if you're hiding it, it looks like you don't think it's a very good thing to do. Mm -hmm. but, but I think the issue of families, they're confused. I mean, there is a, a whole issue, and I don't, I don't want to go too deeply into it, but there's the code is for when you arrest, when you have a cardiopulmonary arrest. And if you're going to try to save the person, you do the full ACOS thing. And if you're not, you don't. But there, there are a number of interventions before people arrest. And therefore, you have these more complicated orders now at the end of life, pulsed or whatever, that, that say, okay, they're, just because somebody's DNR doesn't mean that if their blood pressure drops, you're not going to treat their blood pressure. And what happened was DNR orders were written, and the studies were done, and then house officers and nurses on call would say, okay, here's, here's the chart. What will you do if the patient's blood pressure starts dropping? And they got different answers from everybody. So that's well, how that we to make a cake. So you have to anticipate as things get closer to death or dying, there are a few events. I mean, car the heart, the lung, and the brains, when they stop, that's the way out. But if your liver starts going, if your blood pressure stops going, if your oxygen is real low, there, there, there are things that will lead to an arrest more likely than not, and you need and to- And to Dr. Boslett's point, it yes. really is a failure of communication. After, you know, what, you what, know he that's... Said, what he said, and I have to say that, uh, he, this is a guy who uh, has lived in intensive care units and I, I, everything he said is absolutely brilliant yeah. and based on experience and data. Yeah. But, yeah. So uh, another question um, is that Dr. Boslett, you had said uh, in your first item, the procedural resolution process is an expert consultation to achieve negotiated agreement. The question is, what qualifications would the consult, uh, the, would the consultant need? How, how can we, how can we bring in a proper consultant? Would it be somebody like Dr. Youngner? Would it be what what qualifications would that person need? So I'll give my opinion, and and people disagree with me on this, and that's okay. I don't think this has to be a physician at all. Period. This has to be just someone who's a good communicator, mm -hmm. and a good listener, and someone who's able to sort of just communicate well with others. Like in our hospital, it can easily be a social worker. Sometimes it's a chaplain. Um, often they need kind of a physician next to them to sort of answer some of the technical difficult questions, but sort of moving things from that cognitive um, channel, down, someone who can move things from the cognitive channel down to the meaning channel, which all clinicians cannot do. I have partners who, who are simply incapable of doing that. I think they could, they just don't practice it enough. And so it, I don't think it has to be a clinician I th or a physician. I think it can be anyone who's sort of used to talking to families at times of need like that. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Communication is definitely, uh, we used to call it a soft skill. It is a core competency and, and all physicians don't have it. So you're absolutely right using the interdisciplinary team. Uh, Dr. Youngner, uh, a comment regarding survival and quality. Um, survival is one thing and quality is a completely different concept. What is your opinion about the discussions that occur at the bedside and should they be focusing on one or the other? Well, 
I, I think that the, dis the discussions at the bedside should be what is the, if we know it, what are the goal? The patients came to the hospital with a problem. Now the patient's being treated. What were the goals of the patient in accepting this treatment or you're accepting it? And if, if the goals are not achievable, mm -hmm. uh, if, if the goal is we want to keep him alive, well, to those people, that quality of life might just be life. Mm -hmm. um, and there, are, there are, are, are people and some religious fundamentalists who believe that way. And you can't say, well, no, you're wrong. How, I mean, according to who? But once you get once you get to judging quality of life, uh, the the best answer is the patient should decide that. Yeah, yeah, and that can be really challenging too, if especially if uh, the family members and the patients don't uh, agree yes. uh, on the same thing, which we see all the time. There, there's the work that needs to be. That's yeah. a, identify. Okay, some work needs to be done here. Yeah, right. What is your comment about how the pediatric population, um, how the complications occur um, and the uh, ethic implications um, as opposed to the adult world? It's a, it's a... I'm willing to make a controversial statement. Okay, <laughs> we're ready. Uh, my experience with pediat pediatricians and particularly the younger the kid, the more this is true, is they really don't like to let go. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've had cases where I've told parents, get the kid out of the hospital into a hospice, and then you can make the kind of decisions you want to make because they're not going to let you do it in the hospital. Mm -hmm. I think I, they see themselves, and this is a strength and a weakness in my view, as mm -hmm. advocates for children, but sometimes they can go overboard with that. I know, Dr. Blassett, what do you think? I agree. I mean, ugh, I, I, don't, I don't practice peds anymore, so I'm going to... I, I don't have a ton to say, although I will say that the unit of decisional capacity shifts from looking at sort of saying something like, you know, what would your loved one say about this situation? The unit of decisional capacity is no longer the patient in those scenarios. It's often the family unit as a whole, mm -hmm. because especially with chronically ill kids, the decision, they, they've done this as a team the whole way. And so you're not dealing with like, if I would be to, to get critically ill, they would, would go to my wife and say, you know, what would Gabe say in this situation? How would he handle, how would he want it to be handled? But I've lived an autonomous life my entire life. Chronically critically ill kids, the, the unit of agency tends to be the family unit rather than the kid themselves. So, and that gets into, that, that gets just much more messy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the ability for patients to decide does vary from state to state, um, just with the autonomy the, uh, the parents can have. I know that we've struggled with this issue uh, within Spectrum and Helen DeVos um, on multiple occasions. So, Well, um, you remember, you remember it, 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 well, you probably don't remember because you're not old enough to remember. But, uh, <laughs> And then you get old enough and then you don't remember for other reasons. But, right. anyway, but, but back, I guess it was in, it was during the Reagan administration, there were these baby doe regs passed, mm. said that uh, anybody who was going to stop treatment in a, in a newborn or a, a very young child, there was you, the hospitals uh, and neonatal units had to post uh, signs that said, here's an emergency number you can call and you know we're going to parachute in inspectors mm -hmm. to make sure that th that this uh, you know something horrible isn't happening. Mm -hmm. Now this grew out of uh, I think some uh, what I would say, and again these are all value judgments, was abuse of letting kids with Down syndrome die who could have easily been saved with minor surgery, uh, uh, agreements between parents and doctors to do that. And the reaction was an overreaction. It basically okay. crippled uh, patients and doctors and and uh, uh, families and doctors from making these decisions. And it, I think it's I think those those things aren't uh, posted on the walls anymore. And there's a little more flexibility. But that tradition of the pediatricians and and mostly the pediatricians. I've talked to a lot of nurses. The plural of, of anecdotes isn't data, 
but I've talked to nurses and they, they often are a little uncomfortable with how aggressive the, the uh, neonatologists and others can be in the messages that they give to families. So uh, these are very tough problems, and, yeah. but I do think it's different than adults. I think sure. it's very, very different than very, an adult yeah. intensive care unit, yeah. yeah. Another ethics question. <laughs> What are your thoughts about uh, a patient who has comes to the hospital from a suicide attempt, but had signed a DNR prior to their hospitalization? Should that DNR be honored? Uh, should they be allowed to have hospice care if they are presented with a failed suicide attempt? Can I, can I ask for a clarification? Yes, what is absolutely. Coming, what does coming to the hospital with a DNR order mean? So if a patient had a DNR order, but has a failed suicide attempt and presents to the hospital. Okay, why was the DNR order written? It was, for Who whatever reason, the Who patient. Yeah, uh, the patient wrote it. He had two witnesses. It was all legitimate. And now he presents to the hospital with, he or she presents to the hospital with a failed suicide attempt. What is the obligation of the clinical team to save that patient? Okay. I, I have a strong feeling about this, and I think it's not as hard as it sounds. If a person, an adult, has made some kind of advanced directive about the conditions under which they wouldn't want to be kept alive, say, if I ever have a stroke that's so bad and my brain is so damaged that I can't recognize people, I can't recognize my family. I don't want any aggressive treatment. Mm -hmm. And then, and they do that not because they're depressed, but because their father had, I saw a case like this, their father, it happened to their father and their father hadn't left an advanced directive and it caused a big problem in the family. So the person wrote this advanced directive and then subsequently got very depressed and made a suicide attempt and was resuscitated and then, and treated aggressively in the unit. Well, the patient had not met, not the, the, but let's say the patient had such a bad brain injury that they were in the state that the father had been in, then you have to, uh, you have to honor the advanced directive. That's not part of the suicide. That's honoring their wishes when they were competent and, and anticipated a certain situation. You say, well, they got there by suicide attempt. Well, you want to punish them? I mean, I mean, I mean, what, what's what's the point? Yeah. However, Dr. However, Bosley, do you have this is this is this is as a hospitalist and even as a hospice palliative care physician, this is something I we don't deal with often, but boy, it really uh, is a challenging situation. You, you have any comments or any thoughts about this? Where it gets really complicated is if part of their suicide plan included writing down these wishes in the throes of suicidal yeah. ideation. Yeah. yeah, then disregard it. Right, and, and that's when it gets hard, right? Be, because especially, it doesn't really get that hard, but then it gets hard when then you have a patient who is severely cognitively damaged, right? So, th so they, mm -hmm. they're partially successful in their suicide attempt, have severe anoxic injury, mm -hmm. And now you're stuck with, okay, now what do we do? Right. Because it seems like honoring their wishes is helping them carry out their suicide. We've had a case like this on our ethics committee, not exactly like this, but we've had arguments about, the, about what to do with these and it's just really thorny and it I is. don't have an answer. Yeah. What are your, uh, Dr. Youngner, your, your statement about surrogates should not have unilateral decision capacity? What, can you reflect on that, expand on that a little? Wait, that surrogates should not have... Unilateral decision capacity. No, Unilateral I, decisional capacity. Okay, meaning that they, authority. Maybe you mean authority? The, okay, yeah. You know, capacity usually means like competence, but you mean that should surrogates have absolute uh, authority? Right, you're, well, you're in your... Well, I mean, obviously, if a surrogate's making a decision, the first thing we want to know, is that in line with what the patient would have wanted? Is there any knowledge of what the patient would have wanted? And if there isn't, we generally almost, I mean, every day, hundreds of cases in every hospital, well, that's an exaggeration, but many cases in every hospital, we let families make decisions for incompetent patients without advanced directives. 
Is it absolute? Absolutely not. If a family, if a surrogate's asking for something that the doctor thinks is harmful to the patient and not a benefit for the patient, they can refuse to do it and say, take me to court. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's, no, there's not an obligation to, to do what, it's not, a, it's not like a rule that they say this and then, you know, that's it. Then that, there, there's no other recourse. So doctors are, doctors biggest duty by mm-hmm. far is to their patients. And if their patients' interests are being severely hurt by a surrogate, they have an obligation to step in and stop that from happening as yeah. to the best of their ability. Yes. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I, we advise our patients to make sure that they pick the right surrogate. Oh. It doesn't have to be a wife or a husband or somebody, but just make sure that you pick the right surrogate. Yeah, back in the yeah. days of the um, of the AIDS, when the AIDS epidemic was raging, this was a common problem in our hospital that uh, a gay person who had been estranged from their family had a, a companion who, for ten years, not married because it wasn't legal then, but was had taken care of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, provided amazing care for them, and then they're admitted to the hospital. And suddenly they have no saying at all. And, you know, the estranged mother shows up and says, get out of here. I'm I'm the one who's making the decision. So I I always say, look around. And uh, so if you don't have an advanced directive, in this state, it's your wife is going to make the decision. And if you don't have a wife, it's going to be your grown children. And if those people aren't the people you want to make the decisions for you, pick somebody who you do. And that's and where the verbal follow- power of attorney is useful. Yeah. So a follow-up to that question, how and 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 the, how would you handle it if a named POA um, clearly goes against the patient's decisions that have been cl- clearly outlined um, in their advanced directives? What would I do? I would. I would prob. I, I haven't seen it that often, but I would probably. Um, want other people to get involved. I think that, you, that, that the PO should not be listened to, mm-hmm. uh, but I would, I would say this could be a nasty situation. And if uh, maybe if I was called as an ethics consult, I'd say maybe this is a good thing that the whole committee ought to hear. Mm-hmm. And there should be a more you know, a robust uh, discussion of this and accountability for it. Mm-hmm. But you know, no, I, I mean, that's again, it's, that mm-hmm. surrogate does not have the right to mm-hmm. overrule what the patient wants, or mm-hmm. want it. yes. Now, sometimes interpreting that is, you know, is difficult. But that's right. the, that's the real world. The, and it, I I keep going back to Dr. Boslett's point. It's 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 about the communication. That when the communication is patient centered, um, and it, it it really resolves a lot of these sticky situations. Not all of them, but many but, of them. But most of them. By far, no question. But it's such a hard thing. And time is, I mean, we have to talk about time. These things take time. And I mean, I don't know about your hospital, but mine, people are pretty busy. Every day, (laughs) they're busier. Yeah. And this isn't something that gets paid for very much. Uh, I think the death squad thing is over, so we don't have to worry about that. That's true. You know, but but I do think that the time when it's done upstream, it saves a whole lot of time later. So oh, yeah. what happens, Dr. Boslett, if you uh, encounter two physicians, or perhaps you've been in this situation where two physicians don't agree? Yeah. What would your course of action be there? I've this happens. This, this has never happened to me before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not infrequently in this position, right? I'm, I'm, at a, yeah. I'm an intensivist at a large transplant center, and there are disagreements within transplant committees about whether or not people are candidates for certain patients or candidates right? for transplant. I have my own opinions about whether or not someone re- seems to be a reasonable transplant candidate. And the answer is the same one as the, com- the conflicts with the patient, with patients. It's, it's taking a chair and mm-hmm. sitting down and, and listening to the other side's case and making your own for why you think, um, why you disagree and coming to a principled negotiated agreement. Um, 
it's as simple as that. Uh, the problem mm -hmm. is, again, that's time intensive. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all busy. And um, finding colleagues who are willing to sit down and have that hard discussion isn't always easy. Right. So as much as possible, I try to, you know, seek out, I, you know, we, we, I gravitate doors toward those colleagues of mine for whom conversations difficult or not are easy, mm -hmm. right? Ones I get along with. Yeah. Um, I don't get to pick oftentimes, um, but you know, the, the better I know those that work around me from a relational coordination standpoint, the better those things will go. And so I, I do my best to forge good communications and good, good relationships in good time and bad so that when those conflicts come up, which they inevitably will, mm -hmm. I'm better positioned to help resolve them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, again, we keep going back to the panacea, if I may say so, is that good communication, you know, with, be it with colleagues, be it with patients, be it with families, be it with guardians, it's, it all comes down, it all comes down to that. What is your experience about how many med schools are recognizing the importance of communication um, and, and emotional intelligence? And what is your experience? How many med schools are paying attention to this and really incorporating that into their curriculum? I don't know. I, I, the truth is I don't know. You know, I think, I think a lot are starting to open their eyes to it. Um, Zeke Emanuel wrote a great, um, mm -hmm a great uh, editorial in JAMA a couple years ago saying that we basically that we're, we are valuing IQ way, way more than we should and EQ way less than we should. And I, I, I tend to be one of those people. I'm a, as a fellowship director, you know, my job is to look at an applicant and, and I'm looking for EQ period, full stop. You know, I have the benefit of the fact that they've been through four layer, three or four layers of sort of, um, molding before they come to me. They've been med students, residents, and now they're becoming fellows. So I, I have a bit more data than residency programs do when I make my selection. So mm -hmm. I have the, the benefit of being able to focus on emotional quotient more than anything else. Um, but I don't know the landscape of medical schools and how much time they're dedicating to communication, soft skills, and, and selecting people for emotional quotients as much as an intellectual quotients. I don't know. Yeah. You know, we, we in, in, in my division with, with the students, we, we, we use, um, we don't even use the word soft skills anymore. We use core competency. If you can't communicate, then your, your core competency is not up to par. Um, it, it's still astounding to me how clearly the data supports this, but yet our institutions are still slow in adopting uh, ways to help physicians, students, residents. Um, well, the hard part about it is that it's not measurable easily, right? Yes. We select students and residents for the easily measurable variables. What are those? The USMLE, the MCAT. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Because yeah. They're, they're, pseudo, they're supposedly objective and they're measurable. It's yeah. very hard to measure someone's emotional quotient or their communication skills in a way that doesn't take a year. Yeah. The other thing is that um, I, I've... All, you know, I, since I've been in medicine, there have always been movements to humanize medicine. I mean, it's, I, everybody has recognized that this is since, say, 1966, when I went to medical school, that medicine had this hard edge uh, and that it wasn't, it could be more humanistic. I'm using that in a broad term. And psychiatry was supposed to fill that role at one point and uh, hum medical humanities, uh, and, care, and ethnic, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, uh, but the truth is that um, if you teach this stuff to medical students and then put them out on the wards, and the residents and the attendings think it's bullshit, if you'll pardon my French, which they often do, never ask questions about it, mm -hmm. uh, and nev never recommend papers about it. Mm -hmm. The message is pretty clear. And, mm -hmm. and that's, I don't know what they call that, the hidden curriculum or whatever. That's a big problem because, because that's where your, your professional, if you're a total jerk, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to ever not be a total jerk. And if you're just this <laughs> wonderful, sensitive person as a great communicator, some people are born that way. Yeah. But most of us are in between. And if you go on the wards and all this stuff, people will look to you and say, this is really important. 
oh, what happened to that? Mm -hmm. what, what, that's so important, what happened to that? And that's a real, I think that's a, been a challenge for medicine and it will continue to be a challenge. For yeah, me. yeah. It, it's people taking care of people. That's a setup for complications and complexities. And, um, and people learn from their role models. Right, yeah, and right. Getting most medical students, I'm not their role model. I hate to say it, but it's <laughs> a surgeon or you know, yeah, cardiologist or something, and that's where they're gonna. That's where they're gonna really learn this stuff. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. What is your view um, regarding the uh, interface of religion uh, with um, ethical when when that poses a barrier to uh, what? is perceived as ethical care um, or inappropriate care. Perceived you know, by whom is it? By the physician, by the clinical team, by, yeah. But the patient or family has a religious view that's- Correct. Well, if it's not against the law, if their view isn't against the law, yeah. uh, and it's not this e extreme example of futility, I mean, if somebody says, I believe that life in a persistent vegetative state is worthwhile because God says, whatever, uh, can I say, no, you're wrong? Uh, I mean, so I think, I think that uh, having, having worked in these settings, I think that uh, we often as physicians underestimate how religion can be helpful to people. I mean, we all have the case where, you know, I won't let them die because, you know, it's up to God what happens. You know, and I always say, I've tried it a couple times. Well, if it's up to God, well, then why don't we just stop? And if God wants to save them, yeah, that never works. That never works. I mean, I, 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 my own view is that very often, unless it's very specific questions like abortion or birth control or something like that, that usually people use religion to back up whatever they personally want to do. Right, right. Uh, unless the, the, the religion has clear guidelines in this situation, this is what you must do. And that's because when these things were laid down, nobody had an, an, an idea that right. we'd be making decisions like this. Right, right, right. But, right. but having said that, you, you must respect people's religion. Uh, I found that hospitals that have robust pastoral care pro mm -hmm. pro programs are, mm -hmm. it's so valuable. Mm -hmm. I used to be cynical about that when I first came out of medical school, but it, mm -hmm. it, 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 they're so valuable. And that side of things has to be recognized. That's not saying, well, then the Bible should tell the doctor what to do. That, that's not the same thing at all. Mm -hmm. Dr. Boslett, can you share any experience that you might have had uh, regard? I mean, I, I, again, I hear this quite a bit. Uh, it's not infrequent. Yeah, we, we, you know, we, we cringe when the family, when we're sitting with a family and they bring up the M word, the miracle word, we're waiting for a miracle, right? I mean, it's, and I, I see how staff just kind of crumble under that. Because right. there's no <laughs> idea sort of what to do with that. And, yeah. you know, again, it comes back to, to, to communication. And the way to communicate your way through that scenario is to just lean into it with them. Man, yeah. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm waiting for that too. Yeah, it would be so great. And then you give it some a few minutes to settle. And then you can maybe come back and say, have you, you know, have you thought about what it would look like if that didn't happen? Yeah, but leaning in as much as you can, yeah. because you're not going to fix their decades long decades held religious beliefs in a 10 minute right. family meeting about right. their mom's, you know, respiratory failure. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So get rid of that idea. Yeah, yeah. One last question. Um, I, we're, we're almost at time and um, we have about a minute, but I'd still like to ask this question. Um, any data if people of color are treated differently in the ends, uh, end of life decision making process? The, um, my, and I haven't looked at the data for a while, so I'm sure Dr. Boslett is more up to date. My impression is that poor black people in intensive care units end up getting more care than other people do, not less. I don't know, what's, what's your- and, I don't and know the data. It's not necessarily, and I don't view that as a good thing necessarily. It's not that they're getting more because that was what was best for them. It may be because they're demanding it because it's the only way they can get care. 
is mm -hmm. to get in an intensive care unit or whatever. But um, I think the data don't show, I mean, there are plenty of places where you can show that people don't get good health care because of uh, usually economic things, which may be correlated with, with uh, racial or ethnic things. But in the intensive care unit, and, and people say, oh, they're going to stop because of money. I, I've actually, and, and I'm a cynic about institutions, believe me. Um, I, 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 I've never seen that happen. I'm, I'm not saying it hasn't happened, but I've spent a lot of time in intensive care units. I've never seen it. I was like, hey, let's pull the plug on this. You know, it's costing us so much money. I've just yeah. never seen it. Right, right. Now, yeah. I, I mean, there are other ways hospitals do that by who they market to and, and, and lots of other things. But uh, I want to say one word, quick word about miracles. I mean, the truth is that hospitals, and I can't speak about Grand Rapids, but I can certainly speak about Cleveland. Hospitals advertise miracles. Mm -hmm. And they don't, I mean, they don't, I don't see too many ads that say, you know, if you come here and you're dying and things look really bad, we, we have people who really work with you, right. and talk with you and communicate. We have communicate. Right. Right. <laughs> We've got a great hospice program, right? Come right. we're going to help you die with dignity. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so there's a certain yes. thing about the, the business that sells miracles. Right. And you know, very good point. There are miracles. Very I mean, good point. There are. Very yeah. good point. I, I think we could continue this conversation for a very long time. There's just so much to it. I want to thank you both so much uh, for sharing your expertise, uh, for sharing your thoughts, and, and for having some bold conversation. I think that that's what's really needed, so I appreciate that very much. And thank you so much to the audience. You guys have been, I couldn't get to all the questions because we would be here way late into the night, but uh, please, uh, continue to uh, participate in uh, these sessions. I just want to remind you um, that there are, there's an, another one coming in the uh, winter, uh, February 22nd. Um, it's the West Michigan Medical Ethics Conference. It is called Waiting for a Miracle, the Role of Religion in a Patient's Decision-Making. There's sense. that miracle word, <laughs> you know? Well. So you guys might have to come back and just uh, uh, participate and attend the conference. Um, that, uh, that is a, the daytime event. There's actually an evening event on the same day um, called the role of religion in healthcare. So um, please participate, join us again for this. Thank you all so very much. It's been just, uh, I learned a lot and I had a great time as well. I hope you all did too. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.